the Lord has worked on me about. And uh, it's been so long since I taught on a Wednesday night that uh, y'all probably don't even remember what I'm supposed to be teaching about, do you? We're going to do, these are some discipleship habits, things that when we practice them, and we practice them every day, we will be successful. How many of you know the Bible says the promises of God are what? In him, yea, and in him, amen. So uh, the promises of the Lord and the direction of the Bible, if you follow what the Bible says, okay, here, Y'all try to keep your attention up here if you can, the best, best that you can. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, you know, I remember I was thinking earlier in church, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't perfect in church. I wasn't. <laughs> I, I, matter of fact, I could show out. But, uh, uh I remember about every whooping that I got at church. And I don't believe Daddy whooped me but three or four times that wasn't at church. Uh, you know, I was just watching these youngsters and stuff, and they have such a good time. And we did, too. We did, too. So there's hope. Amen. I think the night I got the Holy Ghost, I played underneath the seat about half the night. I was just nine years old, you know. And we, Brother Robbie, we'd play a while, and then we'd get up and worship a while. See if anybody was getting in the spirit that we could that we could pretend like we was them. Don't y'all laugh? Y'all know what? You could make fun of everybody or ape ape them. We wasn't really making fun. We could shout like everybody in church. Can I get a witness? Sing like them, shout like them. Amen. Every day. How many of you realize that living for God's an everyday thing? None of the things we're going to go over are super quick fixes. None of them are Shazam moments that's just going to fall out of heaven and slap you in the face and all of a sudden you're going to be on fire for God, winning souls and casting out devils and laying hands on the sick. It don't happen that way, okay? But it takes, uh, it takes effort and it takes work. Uh, I read something today uh, in, on the Internet that's going to tie with this lesson. Uh, or this uh, message I have for you, uh, a linebacker for the Rams uh, that's uh, the, like the team leader said today, uh, Brother David, it, man, it just jumped out at me like a million uh, ton of bricks it, talking about, Brother Billy, people that are athletically gifted. But then he said, there's some things that's got to be in you that aren't gifts from God. But there's got to be a drive to be faithful, to be there, to be on time, to diligently pursue studying and, and habits. There's a lot of this walk with God that don't have nothing to do with God. Huh? It's got to do with us. It's got to do with our integrity toward what God has done for us and what the Lord wants to do through us. Amen? Amen? We have to have spiritual integrity because, I mean, a person could go just now unto him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him. It is, I know that's a cuss word, a scary word. It's sin. We have got to, if, if, if the Lord has called us to do something, you know, there's a reason why Paul said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Demas had a job to do. He didn't do it because he loved the world too much. And the things that we're going to go over, which the first was ministry, the second one is prayer, but the things that we're going to go over, if we will do these every day, we will be successful in living for God. Anybody interested in that? I'm interested in it. Ministry was our first one. Had a couple things come to me this week while I was thinking about it. If you're a member of the greeting team, you are in ministry. If you're a Sunday school teacher, you are in ministry. 
If you're a bus driver, and we're going to be looking for one, you're in ministry. If you're a part of the team that cleans the church, you're in ministry. If you're part of the praise team, whether senior citizen or regular, you are in ministry. If you take care of the lawn, you're in ministry. If you're a musician, you're in ministry. If you ever sing a special at any time, you're in ministry. And the attitude that we have concerning our ministry is best displayed when we're absent. Do we call and say, I'm not going to be there? Some do, some don't. What does that say? That says, if you don't bother to call, that says that the way you view your spot is anybody can do that. Huh? Now the Holy Ghost led me to this. So y'all hear me right now. Don't get mad at me. Don't get your fur all ruffled up because this is the Holy Ghost. You ain't mad at me anyway. If you, if you don't like what I'm saying, you're mad at God. We are saying... If we, are, if we have a responsibility and we continually neglect that responsibility, we are by our actions saying it's not that big a deal. If that's the case, then you're not taking ministry serious enough. If you are a praise singer in this church, you are a praise singer seven days a week. If you are a Sunday school teacher, you are a Sunday school teacher seven days a week. Your ministry must be every day. Sunday school teacher, don't wait till Saturday night to look over your lesson. Be preparing throughout the week. Praise singers, listen to new music. Think about things that's going on. Perfect your, your craft. Perfect what you're doing. And then there's areas where you don't even have to have ability. Be faithful. Be on time. Work, meditate, practice, study, whatever the case may be on days besides church days. Go to the prayer room every service. Seek God before each service. If you sing, be prepared to sing every service. If you're going to testify, be prepared to testify every service. If you are a minister, a Bible teacher, or a preacher, you better have something every service. Thank you, Brother Dole. I believe it. Brother Doyle believes it. That means out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. We have got to be instant in season and out of season, Brother McKinney. We have got to realize that our ministry is an everyday thing. You can't live like the devil all week and expect to get on the platform on church nights. Don't ex you disqualify yourself. Boy, we probably ought to be shouting. It matters that much. Our ministry is our life. I've been tempted. I hadn't done it because I take it too seriously and I'm scared lightning might come out of heaven and strike me. But Brother McKinney, I've been tempted to just not show up for church one night. What would happen? Be honest. What would happen? Y'all be fired up. Y'all get fired up when I go preach somewhere else. Brother Billy, every time I go preach somewhere else, half a dozen tell me when I get back, don't do that again. <laughs> well, the other half tell me they wish I'd stay gone, and that's not, <laughs> that's not a joke. <laughs> One person did tell me that. <laughs> And, that, and honestly, that made me feel good. It didn't make me feel bad. But what you expect out of me as the pastor of this church should be what you expect out of yourself for whatever you do in this church. I didn't get not one amen. amen. Thank you, Sister Liz. It's ministry, Brother David. And... It's, it's not because Brother GL decided for you to be that way, nor you decided it yourself. It's because God put you there. Right. Ministry. Every day. Every day. The second thing we do every day, 
Now, all of you, I, I want all of you, especially those of you that was born with the Holy Ghost, I want you to really listen to me tonight because we got to go to another level. We got to go to another level. Oh, God, I feel the Holy Ghost, Brother David. Paul said, Apostle Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind me, good and bad, my successes and my failures, I press toward the mark. What mark is that? That's the mark Jesus set. That's the high calling in Christ Jesus. So we all, look at your neighbor and say, we all got room for improvement. Because I'm pressing, I'm pressing, I'm pressing. Every day, Romans chapter 10. Everybody turn to your neighbor and say, every day. Every day. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus. Let me just let you know something. There ain't nobody ever got the Holy Ghost with their mouth shut. When you caught the Holy Ghost, you got it because you had your mouth open. So those of you that pray, when you seek after God, when you're praying for the Holy Ghost, talk to Him out loud. When you speak in tongues, it ain't for your benefit nor the Lord's benefit. It's for the unbeliever. Isn't that what the book says? Unless you're the unbeliever. Okay? The Holy Ghost. Jesus don't need you to talk in tongues to know He filled you up. Okay? We talk in tongues as the outward evidence that we have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost that we have yielded completely. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him, everybody read those last few words. The word is in your mouth and in your heart. The Bible says you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. You believe in your heart, but you confess with your mouth. Now, please don't misunderstand me. The Lord can read your mind. But it is of utmost importance that we pray verbally. That's how we got it. Huh? It's how we got it started. With the mouth, confession was made to salvation. Basically, Lord, I'm no good. I'm a sinner, and I got to have you to help me. Okay? I got to help you. I, it's, a, it's an acknowledgement of who I am and who he is. And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, let me explain something to you. I know I usually speak in parables, but I'm going to be a little plain tonight. Shame is rooted in a lack of faith. If I am embarrassed to pray, why? Why am I embarrassed to pray? Why am I ashamed? To pray. We don't look at it like that, do we? We don't look at it and think about it like I'm ashamed. But, and the Lord said, now I'm going to be a little plain with you. The Lord said, if you're ashamed of me, everybody say it real loud now. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. Okay. Now I've told you all, y'all know my story about being chicken to pray. Y'all know my stories, but I, I thank the Lord that's, a, that's gone, you know. Thank God. Brother Robbie, it had to be the Lord. 
I, I, I remember getting asked to say the blessing in Sunday school class where I was visiting one time, and I was so tongue-tied and, and tangled up, I, I was humiliated. My throat closed up. I felt like that my face was glowing, like the end of a thermometer. I dare about hyperventilated at the thought of saying the blessing in front of strangers at church, no less. So if I'm embarrassed, why? Do I need to stay that way? Notice David's realization. We better be interested in everything David did, good, bad, or ugly. Because he was a man after God's own heart. Brother Terry, defined that way by God. David didn't define himself that way. The Lord defined him that way, Brother Robbie. A man after God's own heart. David realized this concept. And this helped David to get strength from God and in doing so silence his enemies. And it's so simple. It's so elementary that even a little child can do it. Y'all stay with me now. If y'all see somebody asleep, wave your hand at me and let me sneak back there and stand by him. Psalm 8 and 2. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. But now here, let's reconcile David's words with the words of Jesus Christ because Jesus quoted Psalm chapter number 8. Now y'all stay with me now. Matthew 21, 16. And, Jesus, and said unto them, that's Jesus speaking, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto him, that wasn't Jesus speaking, that was somebody, this is about the same time Jesus talked about them, uh, the stones crying out. And Jesus said unto them, yea, have ye never read, he's quoting scripture, out of the mouth of, remember David said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. So David, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength. Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected, completed praise. It's perfect in them. Now, Jesus didn't misquote David. He simply declared David's thoughts and elaborated on David's discovery. Here's what happens. When I praise the Lord, supernatural strength is loosed on my behalf. I got a few that believe me. I'm going to say it again. David said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest steal the enemy. Somebody say it in nowadays crude language. What's that saying? Shut the enemy up. Shut the mouth of the lion, so to speak, and the avenger. And Jesus said, out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise. Because here's why. My praise is a declaration of who he is. And perfect praise unleashes spiritual attacks upon those spirits that are hindering us. And it silences their voice and demolishes their strength. I wish somebody would hear me right now and recognize the fact that, that when you sit there like a bump on a log when the Holy Ghost is moving, you're telling the devil, I don't believe the Lord's strong enough to deliver me. Let me tell you something, honey. You will never be made by the Lord to praise him. I praise him because I choose to. But when I realized through the power of, of, of my praise, through the word of God, that when I praise him. Now, understand this. I've heard this taught for years and years, and I believe it. You know, Brother Robbie and I have had some discussions about, about praying silently because you don't want the devil hearing. Here's what's for a fact. The devil can hear when you praise God. And what happened 
when the devil was in the wilderness and the Lord said, it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him alone. What the Bible say happened? Then the devil leaveth him. Let me tell you something. The very first thing you need to do to break out of your problem, to break out of your affliction, if the devil's been messing with you and you start praising God, he does not know what to do. So he has to stand there in silence because he cannot rebut what you're saying. Because when you say the Lord is good, the devil can't say but one thing. Amen. Thou believest in one God, thou doest well. The devils believe. What happened? What happened when, Le when Jesus showed up on the shores of Gadara? They come running. I know thee who thou art. In, in the beginning of Mark, in Gadara, in, in, in one place the, the Lord had to shut the devil up because they was going to start blabbing too much stuff about him. You mean that in the Bible? Huh? He made them shut up because the devil, when the devil addresses him, he, he's got to address him with truth. He said, I, who are, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of Israel. You've come to torment us before the time. My praise is a declaration of who he is. Now understand this. Your mouth is the center of spiritual warfare. The mouth can launch either the devil's weapons or the Lord's. Proverbs 18 and 21. Oh, I could preach tonight. My God have mercy. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Let me just lay something out there. One of the things when we're repenting daily as we pray our way through the tabernacle, I say that for a fact by those that do it and by faith for those that are going to. When you come to the altar of sacrifice, you better sacrifice your tongue. Sacrifice your mouth. Because death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof, whether it be death or life. If you love bad news, if you love negativity, if you love gossip, you need to repent. Because it's death. It's death to vision. It's death to your walk with God. If the National Enquirer is, the, is your Bible, you need to repent, go home, throw them all in the trash. Boy, I'm tapped in. I feel like moonwalking or something. I'm so juiced. Deuteronomy 13, 14, and 15. But the word is very nigh unto thee in thy mouth and in thy heart that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Somebody say it's in your mouth. Praise is how we begin to pray. Praise blazes the trail for our prayers to go down. And I'm just going to get a little bit right with you again. What praise does is get you in the mood for prayer. Praise gets you in the mood for intimacy with the Lord. Praise is, is the precursor to us spending time in the presence of the Lord. Say, well, I don't know about that. I do. Because the Bible said that he inhabits the praises of Israel or of his people. Which, Brother Terry, we learned in Bible study the other day that we too are the children of Abraham. Adopted in, grafted in. So the Lord inhabits our praise. And if you want the presence of the Lord in your life, just start praising him. He'll show up. Ephesians 6 and 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I'm not going to dwell on this a long time except I'm going to tell you, learn to pack a lunch when you go to prayer meeting. I believe 
Brother Robbie, I believe, I've heard it testified for years that we can get a hold of the Lord that fast. Heard Sister, Sister Bernice testify how many times about just saying, Jesus! I think she even told a story one time that, that they were coming to meet a car head on. She's hollering out Jesus, and the next thing she knew, they was past it. No, no, she don't have no idea what happened. If I understand correctly, Sister Bernice believed the Lord just let them pass right on through. Because there wasn't no way, Sister Eloise. It's just there. You touch the Lord that fast. But if you're going to be a... Come on, y'all stay with me now. Stay with me. Everybody in here. Especially those of you that need it. You better learn to pack a lunch when you're going to become a prayer warrior. What do I mean by that? 30 seconds ain't going to cut it. Can you be effective in 30 seconds? Absolutely. But if you're going to die out to the flesh, it's going to be a struggle. Stay with me. With all perseverance and supplication, your flesh is going to want to get up as soon as your knees hit the floor. No matter how close you draw to God, you're still in the flesh. Okay? But we learn to not be led by The flesh says, get up. The spirit says, shut up. You start... You start... Uh, uh, speaking to your flesh, it'll die. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Is there anybody in here that prays too much? You need to raise your hand. I'll let you go pour us some Kool-Aid and make us some cookies. I exhort, therefore, 1 Timothy chapter 2, number 1. I exhort, therefore, that first of all, everybody say first of all, supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. If you're going to be an effective Christian, you've got to learn to pray. We have made great improvements in the area of worship. Even denominal churches have copied our methods of worship. How many of you have seen uh, Baptist and Methodist and Presbyterian churches that have been typically stoic and and? How many of you have seen them advertising that they have a regular service and then a contemporary service? All they do is act Pentecostal. And they act like it's just this thing that they just dreamed up. We've been doing it ever since them fellas poured out of the upper room. We just worship the Lord. We're free with our worship. But we're still falling behind in the area of prayer. You young people hear me right now. We can spend an abundance of time talking and texting is included on that. Some people don't even talk on the phone anymore. Spend an abundance of time talking, texting on the phone, listening to the radio or watching some TV program or movie. And I know there's several of you that do it because you watch it and then put on Facebook that you watched it. But we spend so much time doing those things and we cannot spend five minutes to spend time with God in prayer. I will guarantee you, and if you'll excuse the carnal expression, I'd be willing to bet the farm that you could interview every person that's ever backslid from the church of the living God and ask them how much they prayed and they would tell you very little. Very little. We got to spend time in prayer. I am convinced that a lack of prayer is the single most detrimental thing to someone who desires to live for God. Every now and again, you husbands, you hear me. If you're a wife and your husband doesn't live for God, you hear me this. Uh, every now and again, uh, you walk to the, your front doors uh, and you lay both hands on them just like this uh, and you plead the blood of Jesus over your house. Uh, every now and again, you walk to the windows uh, and you put your hands on them uh, and you plead the blood of Jesus over your house. Uh, every now and again, you go out in your yard uh, and you walk you a circle around it uh, and you claim the name of Jesus over your home. I'm telling you, folks, prayer changes changes your life. We got to pray. You, oh God. you pass somebody in the grocery store, you don't have to know what's wrong in their life. It ain't none of your stinking business. 
We need to stop being so nosy and just plead the blood over people. When you walk by somebody in the grocery store and you can tell they're strung out, go stand down in front of the pork chops and pretend like you're looking at them and then you pray for them. Well, I told you before, when you drive by people's houses and you know they're struggling, stop there for a minute and say, in the name of Jesus Christ, I speak peace into that home. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says uh, the word is nigh you, even in your mouth. Speak it out. Speak it out. You're changing people's lives through prayer. Through prayer. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost up in here. It's a daily thing. It's a daily thing. If you're waiting to get to church to get something, you've waited too long. When you ain't got nothing to do and you're bored, drive through town and pray for everybody that you know that you pass by their house. Oh, God. I'm ready for revival. I'm ready for revival. I'm ready for some jailbreak revival. I'm ready for some of you poor sisters uh, that you've been battling affliction. I'm ready for you to overcome it through your praise. I'm ready for you to put the devil on the run because you know that your Redeemer lives. And his strength is made perfect in your weakness. Declare that to the devil. I have before. I've declared it to, I've got down here before Brother Billy, and I didn't feel like praying no more than a man in the moon. I walked around making plans what I'm going to do to the building someday. But Brother Mark, then I remind myself, uh, I may be feeling weak, but he ain't, it ain't hurting him. It ain't done nothing to him because I'm weak. Uh, and so I begin to call on the name of the one that's stronger than I am. Uh, I begin to pray, Lord, lead me to the rock uh, that's higher than I am. You don't have to always, like I told you a few weeks ago, you don't have to be strong all the time. But just when you get weak, turn to the right one. You won't find it in Dr. Phil or Oprah. You won't find love in some dumb vampire movie. You won't find love in all the, I remember Brother Bobby McCool Jr. preached a revival over here on the other side, and he preached a message called Looking for Love in All the Wrong Places. We are. You're looking for acceptance. Uh, the Bible said, with prayer and supplication, let all your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Stop looking for it in other places and get on your knees before God and cry out to Him just like a baby does. That's why the Bible said it's perfected in the mouth of babes and sucklings. Brother Robbie, when they need something, you don't have to guess. You may not know exactly what it is, Brother Manny, but when them babies get their bottom wet or their bottom dirty or their belly empty, guess what? They will open their mouth. That's all he wants us to do. Brother David, he said you have not because you ask not. He wasn't delusional. He was just where we are. Saints of God, we got to pray. Young people, I have to repent just ever so often. Young people, learn to pray now. Learn to pray while you're young. Learn to pray. Try it. I promise you, try it. Pray. Put God first. You will not find the love of your life in his back seat. You'll find the love of your life on your face before God. Let me tell you something, and I know some of us, you know, have trouble with it, uh, but the Bible is full of what the Lord wants to do in your life if you just put him first. Since prayer is so essential, y'all don't get mad at me if I go over tonight. You got to go home, get you a watermelon on the way out. Woo, knock him out, John. <laughs> Since prayer is so essential, Satan has put your prayer life directly in his sights. Our best human efforts and our abilities don't scare the devil. They did that instrumental the other night. 
And I'll tell you what, Brother Eugene's getting on up in years, but he flat tear that guitar up. But as good as you are, brother, that ain't what scares the devil. As good as our singers and stuff are, that ain't what scares the devil. What scares the devil is when somebody's going through a trial or they're going through a tribulation or they just don't have nothing to do. And they put their clothes on or they maybe wrap their old duster around them, roll out of bed, put their knees on the floor and begin to cry out to God. That's when the devil gets scared. Good singing don't scare him. Good preaching don't even scare him. Passion don't scare him. Prayer is what scares the devil. The devil fears praise. He fears worship. Most of all, praying people. Here's why. Because in order to... Now, you can just get down there and talk. You can just get down there and... And if it ain't coming from your heart, you ain't doing no good anyway. Can I get a witness? Okay. You're not doing any good anyway. But when you're really praying... When you're really praying, prayer has to be done coupled with faith. Nobody prays that has zero faith. But he did tell us, Brother David, we don't have to have a lot of faith. Just enough faith to call on his name. He said, if you have the faith as of a grain of mustard seed, you speak to the mountain. Faith and prayer involves faith. When we pray, faith is activated and heaven stands at attention. When we pray, miracles will happen. When we pray, sickness will flee. When we pray, homes will be pay- repaired. When we pray, broken hearts will be mended. When we pray, the bruised will be set at liberty. We have on Monday nights, and le- don't you misunderstand me for one second. Last night, we got through praying at about 15 or 20 minutes after 7, and it was nearly 8 o'clock before everybody left visiting and fellowshipping Our prayer meeting has turned into almost another church service we have anywhere from 20 to 30 on prayer service we run anywhere from 70 to 90 in church those numbers don't match up i hear many people bemoaning the fact that i get people posting on facebook all the time put something else on facebook about them taking down the ten commandments or taking prayer out of schools but they won't bring those same children to prayer meeting to be under the influence of the house of god but we just want to complain about where they can't pray at instead of bringing them to where they can pray jesus said oh i feel the holy ghost in here jesus said My house shall be called the house of prayer. But you have made it. In that particular case, it was a den of thieves. But I would submit to you, what have we made his house of prayer? It's a house of prayer. There you go, sis. I meant to turn them off before church. I forgot. Somebody needs to remind me. I just did that to get them. I forgot to turn the air conditioner down until 3.30 this afternoon. Jesus said, my house should be called the house of prayer. The Holy Ghost fell while a prayer meeting was going on. 120 people in the same room, in the same mindset, Brother Billy, all of them seeking after God. Give it to me, Brother David. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, They were all with one accord in one place. Somebody want to tell me what they were doing? They were praying. They were waiting in prayer. Brother Robbie, they didn't really even know what for. Of course, they knew what Jesus said. But Brother Dole, they hadn't experienced it as of yet. But they were praying. Everybody say, by faith. By faith they were praying. That's why I'm telling you, saints of God, if you want a true walk with God, you're going to have to battle through the don't want to. You're going to have to battle through the flesh. You're going to have to battle through a busy schedule and just make up in your mind, I'm going to stay here till I touch the Lord. Everybody's got stuff to do. Oh, Lord. I've still got a clock up here. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. 
and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak. They weren't in the lotus position. They had their mouth open. And they went, Sister Eloise, from saying, oh, Lord, send the promise. Oh, God, we believe. Let the comforter come. Let the comforter come. Until speaking in heavenly language. As the Spirit gave the utterance. And then we went. Will y'all let me tell you, Brother, Brother Billy did a good job telling a story. Let me tell you a story. Don't get bored with me, okay? Let me tell you a story. The 120 got drunk on Jesus. They're talking in tongues. They're acting like drunk people act, which who, the Lord only knows how because drunk people aren't in control of themselves. They're under the influence. We need to start getting under the influence a little bit more. But about 100 years ago, 105 years ago, about 60 people in a decrepit old building at 312 Azusa Street in the industrial part of Los Angeles. The revival they had ran nonstop in day and night prayer meetings for over three years. In 1905, William J. Seymour, a one-eyed 34-year-old son of former slaves, was an interim pastor for a small holiness church in Houston, Texas. Neely Terry, who was a, uh, he attended a small hole in this church in Los Angeles, pastored by a lady named Julia Hutchins, made a trip to visit his family in Houston late in the year of 1905. While he was in Houston, while she was in Houston, she visited Seymour's church, and while he, she was there, he preached the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, even though he had not experienced it as of yet. This lady was so impressed with his character and his message uh, that when she got back to California, she suggested that they have Seymour come to preach at their church. He arrived in Los Angeles on February the 22nd, 1906, and within two days was preaching at Julia Hutchins Church. During his first sermon, he preached that speaking in tongues was the first biblical evidence of the inevitable baptism in the Holy Spirit. On the following Sunday, March the 4th, uh, he returned to church uh, and found that Hutchins had padlocked the door. However, not all members of Hutchins Church rejected Seymour's preaching. He was invited to stay in the home of a congregation member named Edward Lee, and he began to hold Bible studies and prayer meetings. Seymour and his small group of new followers soon relocated to the home of Richard and Ruth Asbury at 214 North Bonnie Bray Street, and families from local holiness churches began to attend as well. The group would get together regularly and pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. On April the 9th, 1906, after five weeks of Seymour's preaching and prayer, and three days into an intended ten-day fast, Edward Lee spoke in tongues for the first time. At the next meeting, Seymour shared Lee's testimony and preached a sermon on Acts 2 and 4, which I just read to you, and six others received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in other tongues, including Jenny Moore, who would later become Seymour's wife. On April the 12th, Seymour spoke in tongues for the first time after praying all night long. News of the events at North Bonnie Bray Street quickly circulated among the residents of the city. And for several nights, various speakers would preach to the crowds of curious and interested onlookers from the front porch of the Asbury home. Members of the audience included people of all income levels and religious backgrounds. Eventually, Julia Hutchins showed up at this house and received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, evidenced by speaking in her tongues, and her whole church began to attend those meetings. Soon the people, the crowd became very large and were full of people being filled with the Holy Ghost, shouting singing and moaning in the spirit and finally the front porch collapsed off the house uh, forcing the group to begin to look for a new meeting place uh, and a resident of the neighborhood described the happenings uh, said they shouted for three days and three nights in Easter season the people came from everywhere by the next morning there was no way of getting near the house uh, as people came in they would fall under God's power and the whole city was stirred they shouted until the foundation of the house gave way but no one was hurt. 
Eventually, the group from Bonnie Bray Street found an available building at 312 Azusa Street which had originally been an African Methodist Episcopal Church in what was the black ghetto part of town. The rent on this building was $8 per month. And since the church had moved out, the building had served as a wholesale house, a warehouse, a lumber yard, stock yards, a tombstone shop, and had most recently been used as a stable with rooms for rent upstairs. The only sign that it had ever been a church was a single Gothic-style window over the door. Lumber and plaster discarded littered the large barn-like room. Nevertheless, they cleaned it up and had their first meeting on April the 14th, 1906. Frank Bartleman, who was an early participant in the revival, recalled that Brother Seymour sat behind two empty shoeboxes, one on top of the other, and he kept his, high, his head inside the top one. There was no pride in that old building with its low rafters and bare floors. By the middle of May 1906, anywhere from 300 to 1,500 people would attempt to fit into the small building. Men, women, children, black, white, Hispanic, Asian, rich, poor, illiterate, and educated. They flocked to Los Angeles with both skepticism and a desire to participate. The, the intermingling of races and the group's encouragement of women in leaderships was remarkable as it was the height of the Jim Crow era of racial segregation and 14 years prior to women even being allowed to vote in the United States. Worship at Azusa Street was frequent and spontaneous with services going almost around the clock. The Los Angeles Times and other newspapers were not kind in their description. Meetings are held in a tumble down shack on Azusa Street and the devotees of this weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. The night is made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshipers who spend hours swaying forth and back in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They claim to have the gift of tongues and to be able to understand the babble. There is a, this is the newspaper still talking. There is a disgraceful intermingling of the races. They cry and make howling noises all day and into the night. They run, jump, shake all over, shout to the top of their voice, spin around in circles, fall out in the sawdust blanketed floor, jerking, kicking, and rolling all over it. Some of them pass out and do not move for hours as though they were dead. These people appear to be mad, mentally deranged, or under a spell. They claim to be filled with the spirit. They have a one-eyed illiterate Negro as their preacher who stays on his knees much of the time with his head hidden between two wooden milk crates. He doesn't talk very much but at times he can be heard shouting repent and he's supposed to be running the thing. They repeatedly sing the same song, the comforter has come. Little could the describers of the Los Angeles Times have guessed that in the years to come, historians would say that the Azusa Street Revival gave birth to modern Pentecostalism and became the most significant revival of the 21st century in terms of world evangelism. There were three prophecies were given during this revival at some unknown point, and nearly a hundred years later, it sounds a warning for us. It says, in the last days, three things will happen in this great Pentecostal movement. There will be an overemphasis on power rather than on righteousness. You got to obey the word of God regardless of what you feel. There will be an overemphasis on the gifts of the Spirit rather than the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Rather than submitting to His authority. And there will be an overemphasis. Listen, this was prophesied as Zusa Street. Hope I didn't put you to sleep. But there will be an over overemphasis on praise to a God they no longer pray to. We have the doctrine they had in Jerusalem. We have more truth than they had at Azusa. Where we are lacking is in the area of commitment and discipleship. Ephesians 6, 18 and 20, and I'm finishing. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then Paul says, and for me, 
that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Why in the world would the Apostle Paul have to ask the church at Ephesus, pray for me that I can open my mouth? Why, Brother Billy, would he have to pray that? Except the same problem that afflicts many of us also bothered him. Brother Robbie, the Apostle Paul said, y'all pray for me that I'm not a chicken. Any great move of God, any great revival has begun in prayer. The first person received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in 19, January the 1st, 1901, Agnes Osmond, the first person to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, received it as a result of a, a man of God sending his whole Bible school home to study. To find out what the Bible said. We have to be diligent. We have to be committed. It is important that we speak our faith. 2 Chronicles 7 and 14 says, If my people, if my people, if, you know what that means, Brother Billy? His people. Those that are his people, that are his anointed, called, chosen people, have got the option to not. But he said, if you will, if my people, which are called by my name, how many know what his name is? Jesus. How many of you know that it matters what name you're buried in? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, there's the $64,000 question. Humble themselves. Here's what we got a problem. We wait on God to humble us, and that's why we're going through hell on earth. What Brother Chitwood preach? Don't let hell. Hmm. Hmm. Brother Billy, the Lord said, way back there to the Jews, if you humble yourselves. So what's that saying? He's going to get it. Oh, come on now. Philippians says, therefore, he hath highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every let me tell you something honey I will not be among the number have to be made to bow but I will humble myself under the mighty hand of God. What does the Bible say? That he may exalt you in due time. The way up. Say, I don't have time to pray. Join the crowd. Kids keep me too busy. What was happening to those, these folks? Back in these days, they used to have them in the litters. Just a second, brother. How, how many grandma have? How many there? Nine of y'all? Praying this woman I know. Pray, and, and then she raised mama and Aunt Leanna and Aunt Betty. But you know what? When everybody went to bed, she went to the bathroom and prayed. You can do it, but you're going to have to humble yourself to do it. Brother McKinney. Yes, absolutely. 
the people of God. And pray. Humble yourself and pray. And seek my face. Has everybody got something they'd rather be doing on Monday nights? Most usually, yes. Yep. Got a lot of things we'd like to be doing. The biggest thing that I like to do nowadays is nothing. I like to sit back in my chair, turn off. I told you all before, my wife says I'm a weirdo. Brother Robbie, I can turn off every light in the house. No computer, no book, no nothing. Kick back in my chair and be happy as a lark. With the peace and quiet overwhelming me. But instead, I felt like the Lord led me to come back to prayer meeting. Sunday morning, I said, if we're going to division of this church, what we're going to do is we're going to pray, we're going to fast, and we're going to win souls. We're going to pray. We're going to. And so we now have three options. Lead. Follow. Or I can't say the other one because sometimes people tell me it sounds too ugly. But I'll turn around and say it. Lead, follow, or get out of the way. Humble yourself. Sacrifice your time. Sacrifice your will. Oh, if I look back down the road when I've made so many bad decisions, Brother David, if I would have just talked to the Lord a few minutes about it. I'm learning. Brother David, I am learning to just involve him in my whole life. Every decision I make. I, you know, Brother Billy, I want to ask him where I ought to go on vacation. Say, I don't think the Lord, the Lord is interested in every part of my life. And he's interested in every part of your life. And he'll help you in every part of your life. He'll help you. But please don't think, don't wait till you're going to feel like it. Because you'll be among the number that bow your knee and confess with your mouth with the whole world. You know, Brother Robbie, who that's going to really be hard on is those that knew it all along. I can just see them now. No, I know how. I know how. We praise him, and that opens the door into his presence where we can commune with him. I don't want this to be a set-down church no more. If the Spirit of God's moving, let's worship him. Let's pray. If you've got the Holy Ghost and you don't feel like praising God in some way, what Brother Godair say? He said, I want him to wheel me into church, and I, if I have to, I'll stomp my walker for Jesus. Isn't that what he said? If I can't clap my hands anymore, I'll stomp my walker for Jesus. Humble yourself and pray. Let's stand. Don't be ashamed of him. Because we have put such a, such a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Such an aura around prayer. That we can talk to Sister Liz. Sister Liz, how you doing? So good to see you. Appreciate you showing up for church, even though it's halfway through. <laughs> Sister Liz, so good to see you. Appreciate you. Let's pray together, okay? Jesus, Jesus, Lord. Jesus, Jesus. Do we not do that? Yes, sir. Why? Why? Because we got to humble ourselves. And when you humble yourself, it means you're going somewhere where you really don't want to go. If I'm going to cast out devils, I want them to hear me, Brother Mark. I don't want them to have to guess. If I'm going to cast out diabetes out of somebody's life, I want the diabetes to hear me. Say, well, I don't know about that. I know. I know the poor old dumb centurion got it. He said, I also am a man under authority. Diabetes is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Cancer is under the authority of Jesus Christ. Where do we get the faith that we need in order to these kind come out? This kind cometh not 